right, so um, the last couple of weeks, as many of you know, we took a break. We had a Palm Sunday service, then we had a Resurrection Sunday service uh, last week. So we took a little detour, we took a little break from our verse-by-verse study of uh, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. And so this week, we're going to go ahead and continue where we left off. And we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 7 this morning, if you want to start turning there in your Bibles. Now, in these passages that we're going to be covering today, the writer of Hebrews will return back to a theme that he originally began back in chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 5. If you remember, he began to speak on this subject, on the priestly ministry, the superior priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. But he had to take a quick detour because he knew that the readers just weren't going to get it. They weren't going to understand how deep he was going to get into this. And so... Again, after giving them uh, a warning and then some encouragement, he began to renew the subject, the subject of Melchizedek, the Melchizedek priesthood, in the last two verses of chapter 6. Well, here now in chapter 7, he gets right back into it, basically where he left off there in chapter 5, and And now he's going to explain it, explain the Melchizedek priesthood um, in detail. Now, in order to understand who Jesus is more fully, you really must understand also who Melchizedek is and why he's so important and why he's mentioned here in in, in the book of Hebrews. And once you do... It's going to become obvious to you. It's going to become obvious to all of you that in Jesus, we have a perfect high priest who saves perfectly. And so before we get into God's word, let me pray and ask him to speak to us this morning. And as I said, we'll be beginning Hebrews chapter 7 after that. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you brought us all here, that you've... um, uh, blessed us tremendously, Lord, and we we are thankful that um, you know, we're just able to to praise you, adore you, to to worship you with our hearts, Lord, with our minds, with our mouths, Lord. And so uh, now I I just ask that you bless this morning's message, Lord, that your word will go out there powerfully, that it will change lives. It will change hearts, Lord. It will change marriages, Lord. It will save, that it will save lives, Lord. Because your word is that powerful. So use me now as your instrument, Lord. Remove any traces of, of me. And just use me, Lord, to speak your truth. Bless those that are watching, Lord. And show them who you truly are. And how much you love them, how much grace and mercy you you have, Lord. Again, bless this time. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. And the Word of God says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, made Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers and sisters, 
though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will, who will die receive a tenth. But in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And, in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, has paid a tenth through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And, uh, I'll stop there because you know, I want to really break down this, you know, this chapter, these you know, in sections. Now, th- the main idea that uh, this writer is conveying in these first ten verses is that the great king and priest Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and thus greater than the priesthood that originated from the tribe of Levi. But again, let me break it down some more. Melchizedek was an enigmatic figure who appeared briefly on the stage of human history back in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, and then he disappeared. You don't hear from him anymore. Now, there isn't really a lot of information about him, but one thing is apparent. God arranged the details of his life so that he would be an excellent type of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, there isn't much, but we're given some here, we're given some historical facts concerning him in these first, in the first three verses of chapter 7. To begin with, we are reminded that Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. He was king of Salem, who that was later called Jerusalem, and priest of the Most High God. His name and title suggest clearly these two things that he was a man of righteousness and peace, and that he was also the p- political and the spiritual leader of his tribe, of his people. Already here, we see clearly the work of Christ at the cross. In Psalm chapter 85, verse 10, it says, Mercy and truth met together, righteousness and peace kissed. In other words, because the Savior met all the righteous demands of God against our sins, we can have peace with God. Now, when they were both alive, Abraham and Melchizedek, the story in Genesis tells us that Melchizedek encountered Abraham at that meetup He not only blessed Abraham, but in return, he received Abraham's tithes. And that's something we'll get more into in a bit. But the puzzling, uh, the puzzle concerning Melchizedek deepens when we read in verse 3 that he had neither father nor mother, neither genealogy, birth, nor death. Let me say this. It doesn't mean that Melchizedek had no actual parents or that he was never born or that he never died. See, that's not the point here. The thought is that as far as his priesthood was concerned, there isn't record of these vital statistics because his ministry wasn't dependent on them. See, throughout most of the chapter, the subject is priesthood. And the writer is distinguished, uh, is distinguishing between Melchizedek, the Melchizedek, Melchizedekan uh, priesthood and the Aaronic priesthood. In order to qualify, as many of you know, in order to qualify for the Aaronic uh, priesthood, 
a man had to be born in the tribe of Levi and of the family of Aaron. So genealogy was what mattered. It was all important. It all depended. Who your parents were, your, grandpa, your ancestor was, played a big role in what, what um, played a big factor in what role you were going to play, especially if you came from the tribe of Levi. Melchizedek priesthood was quite different, though, because he didn't inherit the priesthood by being born to a priestly family. God simply picked them out and designated him as a priest. God told him, you're going to be my priest. Pick them out. Now, let me also add that verse 3 makes it clear that he wasn't the son of God, as some have mistakenly thought. It says, resembling the son of God. See, a priest's qualification began at birth, and it ended at death. But there's no mention of either one for Melchizedek. And so thus, a case can be made, if you really think about it, that his priesthood, his priesthood still continues to this day. It's continual. Now, yes, we know that he was a human being, he was a person, and he died. But uh, in a general sense, because there is no record of his death, and that's when the priesthood ended for a priest, again, it's, you can say that he's still, it, it's still ongoing. So it's in this sense that he resembles Jesus Christ, because we know that his priesthood continues on to this day. He never died. Jesus did die. But then he rose from the grave and got into that last, last week for Resurrection Sunday. And now he's sitting at the right hand of God interceding for us. And again, we'll get more into that as we go through this chapter. Now for the remainder, again, of this chapter, the author is going to demonstrate that Melchizedek's priesthood is superior to Aaron's. Now, he will... In the rest of this chapter, he's going to uh, use three arguments as proof. Number one, the argument concerning the tithes and blessing. Number two, the argument concerning a change had, that, had, that had taken place, replacing the Aaronic priesthood. And three, the argument concerning the perpetuity of the Melchizedek Deccan priesthood. And so I'll go... Through each one. In uh, verses 4 through 10, we have the first argument. And it opens with the unusual interjection, asking the readers to consider the greatness of Melchizedek. So even the patriarch, patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoil, of the spoils of battle. Now, since Abraham was one of the greatest stars in the Hebrew firmament, in the Hebrew like character list, it follows that Melchizedek must have been a star even in greater magnitude. As far as the Levitical priests were concerned, they were authorized by law to collect tithes from their fellow Hebrews. But Mel when Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham, it was unusual and unconven an unconventional transaction. Abraham, called to be the father of the nation from which the Messiah would come, was paying deference to the one who, was in who wasn't connected with the chosen people. And so, before I go on, I, I, let me quickly mention that this passage isn't necessarily about 
tithes and offerings. I'm not going to make this about money. And I know some people, some pastors, some churches will. They will use this as a, as a reason to say, hey, we need your money. We need your tithes. You know, and Chalzadek did this and Abraham gave him this or that. No, I, I'm simply going to stick to the text and you interpret it as, you know, again, as you can. Um, now, another significant fact is that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 19 and 20, he said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. When one man blesses another man, it's understood that the superior blesses the inferior. This doesn't signify any personal or moral inferiority, of course, but simply an inferiority position. Not a moral inferiority, but just a positional inferiority. This here is, is notable. And you have to keep this in mind because the Jewish readers who were reading this letter, they would have been absolutely surprised, shocked. They would have been blown away because they deeply revered Abraham as one of their greatest national heroes, and rightly so. But now they're learning that Abraham acknowledged a non-Jewish priest as his superior. And so again, that would have completely blown them away. And, again, and, and to think again, it was, it's in their Old Testament stories. And yet maybe it was something that I never really paid attention to. It goes to show that many times you'll read the scriptures and you'll see a story or something there that maybe you've, read a thousand times before but now it's now it's different that's what the Lord does that's how he speaks to you now the fact that Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham Abraham is also notable see the ironic priesthood priesthood tithes were received by men who were subject to death there was a constant succession of priests, each one serving his own generation and then passing on. But in Melchizedek's case, there's no mention of him or his, his death. Therefore, he can represent a priesthood which is unique in that it's perpetual. Perpetual meaning that it's ongoing and it's never, it never ends. So in receiving tithes from Abraham, Melchizedek virtually received them, essentially received them from Levi. Now since Levi was the head of the priestly tribe, it basically amounts to saying that the Aaronic priesthood paid tithes to Melchizedek, and thus acknowledge the superiority of the letter. And so you, you see, he's getting really deep here. And that's what I'm, that's, maybe that's what he was implying back in chapter 5, is I'm going to get deep. I don't think you're going to get it. I don't think you're going to understand it. You know, and he's saying that here, although Levi hadn't been born yet, he was several generations uh, that would come ahead when Abraham paid Melchizedek his tithes in a sense he was Levi was paying tithes to Melchizedek as well so by what chain of reckoning can it be said that Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek well first of all Abraham was actually the one who paid the tithes. He was the great-grandfather of Levi. And though Levi had not yet been born, he was in the Lowens 
of Abraham. That is, he was destined to be the descendant from, descended from the patriarch. So Abraham really acted as a representative for all his posterity when he gave a tenth to Melchizedek. Therefore, Levi and the priesthood that sprang from him took second place to Melchizedek and to his priesthood. Now, as you can see, just within the first 10 verses, uh, Melchizedek's, uh, we can see that Melchizedek's uh, priesthood is superior in every biblical and logical way to the Old Testament Levitical priesthood. But here's the thing. His priesthood was only a type of the ultimate superior priesthood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was, who is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And as the antitype to the type, Christ supersedes it, just as living reality, the real thing, supersedes a picture of that thing. Now, though Melchizedek was king of righteousness and king of peace, he could never make men righteous or ever give them peace. He was only a type. But Jesus, the grand, true, eternal Melchizedekan priest king, gives righteousness and peace. As to righteousness, we understand first that Christ is righteousness incarnate. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus Christ, it says Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see, he's intrinsically righteous. The essence of righteousness, the sum of righteousness, the source of righteousness. Second, Jesus is the bestower of righteousness. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And that's from Romans chapter 3. Third, he is the priestly mediator of righteousness. In bestowing it, he becomes our personal Melchizedekan uh, priest who prays for the working out of his righteousness in every area of our lives. He remains forever our king and priest of righteousness. But Christ is also the king of peace. His peace follows the gift of righteousness, and it never comes before it. The sequence is always righteousness, then peace. We understand first that he is peace, as Isaiah 9, 6 says, that he's the Prince of Peace. That he is the essence and sum and source of all peace. And there is no peace without him. We also understand that he is the bestower of peace. When he came to earth, the angels sang in Luke chapter 2, verse 14... Peace to men on whom his favor rests. On the eve of his death, he said, Jesus, that is, said in John 14, 17, Peace I live with you, leave with you. My peace I give you. And then after his glorious resurrection, he came to his disciples again with the words, Peace be with you. So you see, he's the bestower of peace. 
And finally, now, as our eternal priest, he mediates our growth in peace, and he prays for us. Yes, my friends, Jesus is praying for your shalom your wholeness, and your well-being. He is praying for it at this very moment, there at the right hand of God. See, church, as I mentioned earlier, from Psalm 8510, righteousness and peace have kissed in Christ. And it's this kiss, and it's this kiss that the king returns repeatedly bestows on his pride, on his bride. Sorry, not his pride, on his bride. All right. So now let's look at the writer's second argument that demonstrates that the Melchizedek's Melchized priesthood is superior to Aaron. So let's move on to the next section, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. And I'm going to continue on. I'm going to pick up in verse 11. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek, and not according to the order of Aaron? For when there is, for when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of the law as well. For one, of the, for one of these things are spoken, for the, one, for the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. For one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning the priests. And with this, and this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on the legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been, it has been testified, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, the previous command is annulled because it was weak, and unprofitable, for the law perfected nothing. But a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. None of this happened without an oath, for others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath made by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn, and I will not change, and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. These verses I just read reveal that Jesus Christ is the perfectly sufficient priest king who has made a final effective atonement effective atonement for his people. As I mentioned before reading, in these verses we find the second argument. And there it shows, and that argument shows that there has been much change in the priesthood. The priesthood of Christ has set aside the Levitical priesthood. This wouldn't have been necessary if that Levitical priesthood had achieved its full and final purpose. But the fact is that perfection was not attainable through that Levitical system. Sins were never put away, and the worshipers never obtained rest of conscience, that is, peace. The priesthood that was set up under the law of Moses wasn't the ultimate one. Well, now we have another kind of priesthood. And that other kind of priesthood is now in effect. 
The perfect priest has come now. And his priesthood is not reckoned according to the order of Aaron. That legal type of priesthood, but rather after the order of Melchizedek. In fact, that the priesthood has been changed forces the conclusion that the entire legal structure on which the priesthood was based has changed as well. Now, this here is a very radical announcement. It's like a tolling bell. It rings out the old order of things and rings in the new. We're no longer under the law. Verse 13 informs us that the proof that there's been a change to the law is, that the, fa- is the fact that the Lord Jesus belongs to a tribe which was barred from performing the priestly function by the Levitical law. None of the other tribes, none of the 11, 11 other, or the other tribes were allowed to perform these priestly functions. People tried, and God judged them. One great example was Saul, King Saul. No one was allowed, not even the tr- people from the tribe of, uh, those from the tribe of Judah. The writer also adds in verse 14 that it was from the tribe of Judah that our Lord was descended. I, wa- I want you to remember that the original rules never authorized anyone from that tribe to be a priest. Yet Jesus was, or is again, let me correct myself, Jesus is a priest. Now how can that be? Because the law has been changed. The author then offers additional evidence in verse 14. that There has been a vast change in that vast change of uh, the priesthood. Another kind of priest has arisen in the likeness of Melchizedek. And his qualification for the office is quite, quite different from that of Aaron's sons. See, the Levitical priest became eligible by meeting the legal requirements concerning bodily descent, descent, descent. They had, meaning they had to be born of the tribe of Levi and of the family of Aaron. But what, what qualifies the Lord? What qualifies our Lord Jesus to be a priest like Melchizedek? Well, it's this. It's that his, is that his life is endless, his endless life. It's not a question of pedigree, but of personal inherent power. He lives forever. This is confirmed by the words of Psalm 110, verse 4, where David points forward to the Messiah, Messiah's priesthood. You are forever. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Here, my friends, the emphasis is on the word forever. His ministry, Jesus' ministry will never cease because his life will never end. The law which set up the Aaronic uh, priesthood has been annulled. It's been canceled because of its weakness and unprofitableness. It's been canceled. By the coming, when Christ came. And as some may ask, in what sense was the law weak and unprofitable? Wasn't it given by God himself? Could God give anything that was weak, impotent, and useless? Well, the answer 
that God never intended this to be the ultimate law of priesthood. It was a preparatory to the coming of God's ideal priesthood. It was a partial and temporary picture of that which could which would be perfect and final. It was also weak and useless in the sense that it made nothing at all perfect. For example, the people were never able to go into the presence of God in the most holy place during the Old Testament times. This enforced distance between God and man and was a constant reminder that the sin question was not settled once and for all. But now, now, church, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. That better hope is the Lord Jesus himself. And those who have him as their only hope have perfect access to God anytime. That veil is no longer there. That, that uh, roadblock, is, it's, it's not there anymore. You can go directly to him. There's nothing stopping you now. That is, again, if you are a believer, if you are born again. So not only has there been a change in the order of the priesthood and in the law of the priesthood, but there's also been a change in the method of induction. The reasoning here involves around the use of God's oath in connection with Christ's priesthood. The oath signifies the introduction of that which is unchangeable and everlasting. Again, let me mention this. The Aaronic priests, the, Aaron, the priests that came from Aaron, were appointed without an oath. Therefore, the implication is that their priesthood was intended to be provisional and not enduring. But God addressed Christ with an oath in designating him as a priest. The form of, the, of that oath is found in Psalm 110 verse 4, which the writer here quotes. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. God places behind Christ's commission, the eternal verities of his throne and the immutable attributes of his nature. If they can change, the new priesthood can change. Otherwise, my friends, it cannot. It follows from this that Jesus is the guarantee of a better covenant. The Aaronic priesthood was part of the old covenant. The priesthood of Christ is connected with the new covenant. Covenant and priesthood stand or fall together. The new covenant is an unconditional agreement of grace, which God will make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. When will he do this? When the Lord Jesus finally sets up his kingdom on earth. As believers today, you and I, we can enjoy some of the blessings of this new covenant. But the truth is that its complete fulfillment won't be realized until Israel the Jewish nation is restored and redeemed 
nationally. So you see, Jesus is the guarantee of the new covenant in the sense that he himself is the guarantee. By his death, burial, and resurrection, he provided a righteous basis on which God can fulfill the terms of the covenant. So his endless priesthood is also vitally linked to the unfailing fulfillment of the terms of, a, of the covenant. All right. The third argument is made in the last, this last part of the passage of chapter 7. So, again, let's pick up in verse 23, if you have your Bible still open. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. Now, many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives, lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests to do, first for their own sins and then those for the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. So again, the point the author is making here is that Jesus Christ is superior to the Levitical priest because his priesthood is both lasting and perfect. He intercedes for those who draw near to God and the sacrifice of himself that he offers to God accomplishes all that is necessary for salvation. We're told in verse 23, there were many Levitical priests. According to one estimation, there were 84 high priests in the history of the nation. And of course, there were innumerable lesser priests. The office periodically changed hands because of the death of the incumbents. The ministry suffered from these inevitable interruptions. Now, in the case of Christ's priesthood, there's no such failure because he lives forever. His priesthood is never passed to anyone else, and there is no interruption to its effectiveness. It's unchangeable and in untransmissible. Intransmissible. And because he lives forever... He is also able to save to the uttermost those who have come to God by him. Now, generally, many think that verse 25 is referring to his work in saving sinners from the penalty of sin. But listen carefully here. Verse 25, actually, there, actually, the writer is speaking of Christ's work in saving saints from the power of sin. It's not so much his role as savior as that of high priest. There is no danger that any believers will be lost. Their eternal security rests on him always living to intercede for them to intercede for us. Now, when most people think of intercession, here's what they picture I sinned again. And Jesus, my intercessor, pleads my case before the Father. Okay, I hear your presentation, son, the Father says. So, because you are 
the intercessor, the charges against, you could put your name there, have been dropped. But wait, that's not what happens. In chapter 1, we saw that after he purged our sins, Jesus went to the right hand of God, or right hand of the throne of God, and sat down. Therefore, although Romans 8 declares that he is at the right hand of the Father making intercession, he's doing so not with his words, but again, listen, with his wounds. He's making intercession for you and for me with his wounds. This is an old case. I was, you know, I was, I think I was 18 when this case came out. So maybe some of you are familiar, or maybe some of you aren't, but but some of you are familiar with these names. Maybe some of you aren't, but both Johnny Cochran and Marsha Clark stood when they made their cases before the O.J. Simpson trial because they were trying to persuade a jury. Neither side felt their case was secure enough to sit. On the other hand, if you walked into the home of a, another football legend, football legend, Jim Plunkett, and heard him say, I was the greatest quarterback, there would be no discussion, no debate, no argument. His Heisman Trophy on his mantle will be the absolute evidence of the fact that Jim Plunkett was a great football player. So too, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and his wounds in his hands, on his feet, on his side, and the scars of his crown of thorns settle the issue. Jesus isn't talking to the Father into being merciful to me. He's not asking the Father to be lenient with me. His scars alone are sufficient. That's why when Thomas finally saw Jesus, Jesus didn't say to him, let's talk doctrine. What did he say? Touch my wounds. So you see, he is able to save them for, for all time because he is his present ministry for them is at God's right hand and can never be interrupted by death. We also see in verse 26 that Christ's priesthood is superior to Aaron's because of his personal excellence. He is holy in standing before God. He is innocent in his dealings with men. He is undefiled in his personal character. He is separate from sinners in his life at God's right hand. He is exalted above the heavens in his present and eternal splendor. I agree with the writer that indeed this is the kind of high priest that we need. See, unlike the Levitical priests, our high, our high priest doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day. He only had to do this once for all time. He doesn't need to offer for his own sins because he's absolutely, absolutely sinless. A third amazing way in which he differs from the priests is that he offered himself for the sins of the people. In this instance, the priest actually gave, let me repeat that, in this instance, the priest, who is Jesus, he actually gave himself as a sacrifice. He didn't give over an animal as a sacrifice. He gave himself as a sacrifice. Wonderful, matchless grace of Jesus. Finally, in verse 28, the writer states that the law sets up the priest who are personally imperfect they are characterized by weakness and failure. They are only ritually holy. But God's oath, given after the law, appoints the Son as a priest 
who is perfected forever. And again, this earth, this oath is referred to in verse 21 of this chapter, which and quoted from Psalm 110. Well, the application here in this last section is, is obvious. I hope you can see it. Why turn away from such an adequate high priest? What more can you find in any other person? The men who served under the law of Moses had human infirmities and weaknesses, and they often failed. Our heavenly high priest has been perfected forever, and there is no spot or blemish in him. This, my fellow believer, my brother and sister in Christ, is the high priest that we need. Thus, this chapter, to kind of bring it all in, shows us that Jesus completely fulfills the picture and the type of Aaron's priesthood. But he is represented more fully in the Mel Melchizedekan order. And so why, maybe some of you are asking this right now, why is this important? Because every one of you is relating to Jesus in one of those two ways. Many people relate to Jesus only as the fulfillment to Aaron's of, of the Aaronic priesthood. And what they see is this. A man who became like us, who laid down his life for us, who did not choose that position for himself, but only sought to glorify the Father and to obtain our salvation through his sacrifice for us. And for them, that's as far as it goes. They don't understand that Jesus isn't only the fulfillment of the Aaronic priesthood, but that he is the Melchizedek. Melchizedek ministry isn't to obtain salvation. It isn't to obtain salvation. It's to maintain salvation. That's why Jesus ever lives to make intercession. That's why he forever lives to make intercession. The Melchizedekian order uh, is a ministry of maintaining my salvation, your salvation, based upon his wounds. And it's a done deal. This means that as you drive home tonight or later on today, or sometime during the day, week, night, and you have something to, or need, or have something that you need to pray about, or a promise that you wish you could claim, you don't have to say, I can claim this promise because I haven't, I can't claim this promise because I haven't prayed with the kind of intensity I should. Or I can't pray now because I haven't read my Bible in three months. No, I can simply say, you can simply say, Jesus continues to save me because his ministry, because, because his ministry is intercession based upon what, he's, what he once offered upon the wounds he now has. Let me repeat that. Jesus continues to save me because his ministry is intercession based upon what he once offered upon the wounds he now has. There's no discussion about your worthiness. You're free. You're free. You're completely and totally free. Aaron's line 
was always busy working, always pleading, always sacrificing. In the Melchizedekian order, however, there's nothing more to be said, nothing more to do. All of it's done. It was done once and evermore when our great high priest, Jesus Christ, offered himself as a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. There's nothing else you need to do to get to heaven. There's nothing else you need to do for God. No works. None of that. Grace alone. Faith alone. I'll begin by, again, ending saying this. Have you ever gotten a promotional letter from, let's say, uh, uh, well, it could be an advertising firm or whatnot, or that said in the fine print, actual results may vary. Or amounts used in this letter are, an illustra- are for illustration purposes only. Actual earnings may be less. Those statements greatly limit the promise of the offer. But God promises that because Jesus is our superior high priest, salvation is guaranteed to all who draw near to God through him. He's a perfect high priest who saves perfectly. There is no fine print stating sinner must clean up his act. Sinner must clean up his life first. It doesn't say offer does not apply to really bad sinners. This offer does not apply to murderers. This offer does not apply to those addicted to to drugs. Those who are alcoholics. Those who are addicted to pornography. Those who... Those who are cheating on their wives or their husbands. No. Jesus promise promises. Jesus prom, Jesus promises in John chapter six, verse thirty seven. The one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Have you come to him? Have you come to Jesus to receive the forgiveness of your sins? Are you ready to be forgiven of your sins? Watching and listening, are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and make him him your personal Lord and Savior? If you are, let me tell you this. He guarantees salvation for all of eternity. If you come to him, he will guarantee it. And if you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus. So wherever you're at, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. Pray this. With all your heart, with all sincerity, don't pray this is like a ticket to get out of jail, because it's not. He knows God can see straight into your heart and knows if you really mean it. So sincerely pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And I ask for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. Yes, I now believe that you died for my sins and rose from the grave. I now turn, I now repent of my sins and confess you, you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me to the top 
with the Holy Spirit. May it just overflow from my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me, teach me, to show me in this new born-again life that you've given me. In your name, I pray this. Amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.